we got a few people logging in, perfect. Thanks for checking it out, guys. Feel free to leave comments in the bottom, Jennifer. I see your comment there, perfect. If you leave a comment, there's like a 30 second delay or so, so that's what's taking me a minute to respond back. So I'm gonna get right into it. Uh, I told you I started at 7, 701, so let's get going. Um, just wanted to um, put my face on the camera so you guys can uh, see my face, recognize me a little bit. And uh, we'll flip over to the PowerPoint now. Let's see here. So hopefully you guys can see that PowerPoint now. Um, just making sure it's coming up here. Give me one second. It should be showing up here in a second on the other computer screen that I'm watching to make sure everything's going well. And you guys can see what I can see. So today we're going to talk a little bit about um, spot, um, Spravato. I keep wanting to call it Spariva for some reason. I don't know why. Um, I guess being an airway person, and Spariva is the top of mind. But we'll be talking about Spravato. Looks like everything's working good. Spravato is the S-ketamine that Janssen um, just got approved by the FDA. And so we'll be chatting about that in this broadcast here. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I have um, a company called the Ketamine Academy, and I teach people how to start ketamine clinics. So just going to throw that out there for anybody who's interested. Um, if you're interested in starting a clinic or have questions or need help with your clinic, I'm happy to help you out. Um, that's really what I enjoy doing. So you guys are probably wondering if anybody who hasn't seen me before, who the heck is this dude? Um, so I'm a nurse anesthetist. I actually started a ketamine clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 2017. And I've ran it for just under a year before I sold it. We found out my wife was pregnant and so we moved back to Florida where all my family is and um, wanted to get closer to the family uh, for when we have our, our delivery, which we actually just had a couple days ago. Um, which is awesome. I've got a beautiful daughter. Um, her name is Aria, and I'll show you a picture of her in a second. Um, so a little bit about me. I've got um, a Master's of Science in Anesthesiology. I've got a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Management. Um, I'm a nurse anesthetist. I'm also a uh, lieutenant in the Navy Reserves, where I provide anesthesia as well, and um, soon to be graduating with my um, MBA in two classes, finally. A long road working on that one part time. Um, this here is my beautiful daughter Aria, and uh, me holding her there on the right. We just had her. Um, when was it? Friday evening at six thirty. So I apologize if uh, if I appear tired. There's been a um, lack of sleep going on around here lately. We've got lots of crying babies. So um, what you guys came here for, which is the Spravato chat. So what is Spravato? Um, you guys probably all know it's the nasal ketamine that was approved by the FDA um, just a couple, I think it was a week ago, um, two weeks ago. It's a Schedule Three controlled substance. And let me just move these items out of my way here. So S-ketamine is, um, it's a nasal spray. It's only approved for treatment resistant depression. So it's not approved for PTSD or any other mental health conditions or for pain. Um, what the Spireva um, report to the FDA considers to be treatment resistant depression is somebody who's had um, undergone antidepressive treatment with at least two medications that uh, failed or didn't have adequate results. So S-ketamine is the um, S enantiomer of the full ketamine molecule. So it's essentially half of the ketamine molecule. Um, when you're talking about a, a typical molecule, you have two mirror images of, her, of each other, um, sort of like your hands where they, they look the same, but you can't overlap them. Um, so that's essentially what each enantiomer is. This one is the S enantiomer. Um, typically when it comes to pharmacology, um, a lot of drugs have the... Um, property that one enantiomer tends to have a lot of the medical benefits while the other enantiomer has a lot of the side effects. And so that's what Janssen was trying to do uh, with this medication was to take the, the side of the molecule that they thought was responsible for the beneficial effects and eliminating the half that was um, responsible for the side effects. Um, didn't work out as well as planned. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
So it is um, a prescription medication, and it's supposed to be taken alongside a traditional antidepressant. Every single study that Janssen did um, was a patient that had received nasal ketamine, and they were on a, um, I, I believe all of them were a new antidepressant. Um, so a couple of uh, key takeaways for the presentation is that a ketamine, um, the Spravato S ketamine has to be administered in an office setting, supervised, and the patient has to stay there for two hours. And the patient cannot drive home, just like um, after an IV infusion of uh, the regular ketamine, which is the racemic mixture. So Spravato uh, S ketamine, like I said, controlled um, Schedule Three controlled substance. It is um, used in conjunction with an oral antidepressant for just treatment resistant depression. Um, it's not approved as an anesthetic agent and has um, the efficacy for any sort of pain relief has not been um, proven or studied. So as far as it comes to uh, when it comes to side effects, this is all from the package insert. A lot of these are really similar to the normal ketamine molecule type of side effects. And obviously sleepiness and sedation. Um, clinical trials showed that 49 to 61% of patients develop some sort of sedation and actually 0.3% of Spravato patients actually lost consciousness. Um, hence the need for continuous monitoring during the treatment. Um, additional side effects, dizziness, fainting, spinning, anxiety, all normal stuff if you've treated patients with um, normal ketamine in the low dose sort of outpatient setting. Um, you see this type of stuff all the time. There's uh, a feeling of disconnectedness on the patient's side. So disconnected from their selves, dis disconnected from thoughts, feelings, space, time, um, all that sort of stuff. Long-term cognitive impairment. Um, what was in the package insert was that uh, Spravato says no adverse effects of Spravato nasal spray on cognitive function were observed in the one-year um, study, which was one of their phase three trials. I see a few more people logged in. Perfect. I got, uh, let's see, we got Doug Schaefer's here now. I see, oh, I'm sorry, I don't even know how to pronounce your name. Acme is here. Thanks for jumping on, guys. If you're here, just uh, sign on a comment and make sure I can make sure uh, you guys can hear me okay and check in. That's awesome. We can get a little feedback and interaction going. Um, like I said, there's like a 30 second delay between your comments and when I see them. So just FYI. Um, when it comes to side effects with Spravato, and it, we're talking about ulcerative colitis or interstitial cystitis. Um, the package insert, insert says that um, there was a higher rate of urinary tract symptoms, um, dysuria, nocturia, and cystitis, um, but there was no cases of esketamine-related interstitial cystitis, which is what a lot of people um, sort of associate the uh, uh, as, as a major ketamine side effect that's not really uh, entirely proven. So, hey, Kathy, I see you're here now. Cool. Thanks for checking in. Um, additional side effects, the package insert states that there's risk for abuse and misuse. Um, you want to screen your patients for a history of uh, addiction and um, drug abuse. Um, additional side effects, nausea, vomiting. We see that all the time with IV ketamine um, to the point where some clinics just proactively give Zofran uh, for all their infusions and then others will just treat at-risk patients for the regular um, IV ketamine. So there's increased risk of suicidal thoughts or uh, actions, and that's pretty much in line with any sort of antidepressant. Um, pretty well known fact that when somebody starts a new antidepressant, they you know sometimes have uh, they're feeling a little bit better, so they might actually act on the thoughts of suicide. Um, increased blood pressure is another side effect. We see that all the time with the IV infusions. Um, shockingly, they they say that. Um, the increase was a little bit higher for the nasal ketamine than I was expecting. They um, reported an increase of, let's see, eight to 17% of patients experienced an increase of more than 40, per, uh, 40 millimeters of mercury in their systolic blood pressure and or 25 millimeters of mercury in their diastolic pressure within the first one and a half hours of administration. Um, 
that was a bigger jump than I was expecting, especially since the bioavailability is so low and they're getting not, uh, typically not getting a very big dose. Um, so to have 15% or so have that big of a jump in their blood pressures, um, pretty high. I feel like uh, when I'm doing the ketamine and IV infusions, I've rarely come across a jump in blood pressure that high. Um, and I've done several hundred IV infusions. So that's an interesting report. Um, <clears throat> it says that the blood pressure peak is um, something that happens about 40 minutes after the administration and can last up to four hours. So some contraindications that they have on the package insert. Um, we got a couple more people checking in. Hey Clint, thanks for checking in. Joshua's here now. We got Peter. Cool. Looks like you guys can hear everything. Um, so back to the contraindications. Uh, we got vascular aneurysms, any sort of aneurysms whatsoever, abdominal, um, any vascular aneurysms. Uh, any sort of hemorrhagic uh, brain bleed, any AV malformations. Um, most of that stuff is, you know, obviously you don't want to spike somebody's blood pressure who has these conditions or you can cause some serious problems. Um, and then they list uh, allergy to ketamine or esketamine as a contraindication. So <clears throat> what uh, Janssen did um, as part of essentially the, the phase four clinical trials, which is essentially what they're in now, um, after a uh, medication gets phase three, um, they're allowed to market the drug and sell the drug, and then they have to continue on doing a phase four clinical trial per the FDA. And part of that strategy with them was to create something called um, a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. So they call it the REMS strategy and all their um, paperwork and online. So if you see REMS, that's what it's talking about, the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. Um, and it has to do with their phase four uh, trials and the data that they're trying to get. Um, so every patient, uh, in order to get the esketamine, the Sprovado, they must enroll in the REMS program. Every healthcare setting must enroll and be certified. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that again later, um, what the certification means. But every clinic has to be certified and enroll in the REMS, um, in the, the REMS strategy. And then also every pharmacy must be certified. If you guys have any questions at all, feel free to ask them. Um, I can see them in the chat, just a, like a 30 second delay or so by the time they pop up on the other screen there. So um, Sprovato with the um, day of treatment. Um, this is what you need to know. NPO for two hours is what the package insert recommends. NPO for clears for 30 minutes. Um, sorry, I got a little typo there. I got baby brain going on. So you wanna take the blood pressure uh, according to the package insert before administration and then two hours after administration and then anytime you think there might be a blood pressure issue um, between the patient the, between the time was, uh, the patient started the uh, nasal spray to the time that they're leaving your clinic. Um, it doesn't recommend or indicate or anywhere in the documents say that they have to be cardiac monitored or pulse oximetry monitored, um, anything like that. It just says that they have to be supervised. So in the package insert, uh, actually this is from the website, it says Provado is intended for patient administration under direct observation of a healthcare professional. And patients are required to be monitored by a healthcare provider for at least two hours after administration. And Spravato must never be dispensed directly to a patient. So we'll talk about how the patient's gonna get the, the um, Spravato here in the next few slides as well. <clears throat> So the initial treatment that's recommended is uh, two times a week for the first four weeks. And this is directly um, out of their, yeah, that was actually out of their, uh, one of their inserts as well, right here, this um, clip that I have. So you can see exactly what the, the dosing is recommended. So day one, starting dose 56 milligrams. Um, this is for week one to four. So you're gonna administer twice per week. Uh, day one, they start low, 56 milligrams, and then it, um, Subsequent doses, they say you can do 56 or you can increase the dose to 84 milligrams. And then during the maintenance phase, which is weeks five to eight, you're gonna administer once a week. Um, again, 56 milligrams or 84 milligrams. It's the provider's discretion. There's no set uh, dosing requirement or anything like that. And then uh, from weeks nine and later, they administer every two weeks um, or weekly if it's uh, indicated. Same thing, 56 milligrams or 84 milligrams. Uh, 
So this is um, the device, the nasal spray device that they have created for this product. Um, each, each spray will deliver um, two doses, or I'm sorry, each device will deliver two doses. Each spray delivers 14 milligrams. And so um, a normal starting dose would be two devices. It's going to be two sprays in each nostril per the package insert. So you'll give uh, 28 milligrams in each nostril. And then if you're going to give up to 84 milligrams, then you would need three devices to do that. So they've got some instructions here on how to use it. Uh, basically don't prime the device. These dots here, um, in step two, you can see those two green dots. That tells you how many doses are left in the device. And they tell you to tip the patient's head back um, at a 45 degree angle. Um, just some more instructions and they recommend um, resting for five minutes in between um, each spray into each nostril. So when it comes to enrolling in the, uh, to become a certified uh, clinic or certified healthcare setting, this is the questionnaire that they give you and you can complete this online. Um, I did mine and it, it took like less than 10 minutes. So they're basically going to ask you what, what your site of care is. If you're a clinic, a teaching institution, a pharmacy, they want your DEA number and the DEA address on your DEA license is the only location that the um, Spravato can be delivered to or administered in. According to their instructions, they get your licenses, they get your uh, business address. All this information you see here is what they ask online. Pretty quick to get through. It's a bunch of check boxes once you do the online, or you can fill out the actual like paper form. So this here is a, a screenshot of the 263 page document that Janssen submitted to the FDA for their final approval. And this goes over like every study that they did. So it goes over the, um, the actually I don't think it goes over the phase one. I'd have to double check, but phase two and phase three trials it goes over. Um, specifically the most important ones are the phase three because those are the randomized um, uh, double blinded, most valid studies. So the phase three is, is the most important. Um, just a quick review here of what the FDA approval process looks like. There's four phases total. Um, after phase three, the FDA, if it approves, um, after phase three will allow a pharmaceutical company to market and sell the drug. Phase one typically involves 20 to 100 healthy volunteers with the condition. The study takes a few months and the purpose is just to establish safety and, um, and a dose range. Phase two is going to be um, up to several hundred volunteers with the condition. Length of study is typically a few months up to a few years. And the purpose is to study the efficacy and the side effects. And then phase three, which are the most important, um, typically has a, um, a, a sample size of 300 to 3,000 volunteers with the condition. And the studies oftentimes will go on um, one year up to four years. And the purpose of the phase three is to establish efficacy and monitoring for adverse reactions. And then uh, what we're in right now, or what Janssen's in right now is the phase four. It takes place after the FDA approval. And this is again for safety and efficacy over um, a longer term period. So one interesting um, note that I found when I was putting this presentation together was that per John, uh, a John Hopkins study in 2018, the average cost to bring a new drug to market in the US is estimated to be between two and three billion dollars, which is absolutely insane. And something needs to be done about that. That's just crazy. Excuse me. So let's talk about um, the Spravato phase three studies. There were uh, five, 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 five phase three studies total. Um, three of them were for short-term double-blinded um, studies. And so they were called, uh, right here, as you can see in the PowerPoint, they were called Transform 1 and 2, and then Transform 3. So Transform 1 and 2 had um, a population that was between 18 and 64 years old, and then Transform 3 
had a population that was elderly over 65 years old. And so this, the sustained um, one was the, the next of the studies. And this was a study that was uh, designed to test the, um, the maintenance effects of the esketamine after discontinuation. So compared to um, continued esketamine, this one compared uh, continuing esketamine treatment with discontinuation of the esketamine um, in uh, delaying relapse um, in patients with treatment-resistant depression. So they called this the maintenance of effect study. And this figure down here kind of just sums it all up for you. Um, there was three short-term studies, transform one, two, and three. There was a maintenance of effect study, sustain one. And then there was um, the, the fifth and final study was the long-term uh, open label safety study called sustain two. So we'll briefly just um, touch base on the transform studies. Uh, don't want to put everybody to sleep here at seven o'clock at night. And so I'm just going to breeze through this. The actual document, if you really want to get into like the statistics and everything, the 263 page document, I'll post in this group here. Um, that's public knowledge. It can be found anywhere on Jansen's uh, site, but I'll post it here for anybody who wants to uh, leisurely read a 263 page detailed analysis uh, with lots of statistics. Um, but in short, uh, this, this uh, diagram here essentially sums up the studies. It shows you the sample sizes. And on the left-hand side here, transform one, you can see it failed to achieve any statistical significance. Um, but they claim that it shows uh, clinically meaningful improvements. That was the statement Jansen used. So they failed two of the five studies, um, didn't show any difference at all. They tried to claim that it showed statistically, or I'm sorry, they tried to claim that it um, showed clinically meaningful uh, improvements though. Take that with a grain of salt. Transform two, um, that study did have um, statistical significance when the final data came in. Transform three also failed to achieve statistical significance and they made the same statement um, saying that the results did show clinically meaningful improvements. Um, they didn't really define that though. So this is the um, SUSTAIN-1. This is the Withdrawal Maintenance Effects Study. This study did show um, statistical significance. And this kind of outlines the, the study process and sample size and everything, this diagram here. This came out of that 263-page document. So SUSTAIN-2 uh, was the final study of the five and it aimed to establish safety. So it was la it, this one lasted one year, 52 weeks. And this one did get, um, did achieve statistical significance and it appeared to be that patients who continued um, treatment with esketamine and an oral antidepressant for up to a year had sustained um, antidepressant effects. So the overall performance of Sprovado, essentially two of the five uh, phase three studies failed to demonstrate any sort of statistical significance. Um, and uh, this is kind of shocking because the nasal spray is bolstered by the addition of a traditional antidepressant. And so the fact that two, essentially two antidepressants combined um, failed two out of the five studies is uh, not very impressive to say the least. Um, I was actually reading an article that stated, um, and I don't, I didn't back this or I didn't uh, fact check this, but uh, I read an article that stated that this drug, Sprovado, is actually one of the least effective drugs to ever be approved by the FDA. Um, but essentially, because it's sort of a, uh, it acts on it in a different fashion, on a different mechanism, has a different mechanism of action than um, more traditional antidepressants, and it has a pretty pretty good um, safety profile that they decided to go ahead and put it through. Um, so that's just a side note. Like I said, I didn't fact check that, but that was something I read as I was doing all this research for this presentation. So esketamine appears to, uh, appears to be substantially less effective than the racemic ketamine. Um, we've seen tons of studies now. Um, well, I wouldn't say tons, but there's many handfuls of studies using the IV racemic version of the ketamine molecule, and it's all the data is showing, um, and it's been repeated multiple times, 
uh, efficacy rates anywhere from 60% all the way up to 70% in some studies. So far more effective than just what we got here with this bravado. Um, and that's ketamine by itself as well. So IV is clearly like way more effective than Spravato, but Spravato, um, you know, has its pros as well uh, for the patients, I guess. Um, <clears throat> what we really need is a head-to-head -head study with, that's gonna compare racemic versus S-ketamine. And will that study ever be done? Who knows? Studies are expensive. That would be ideal. I think um, the racemic would clearly uh, demonstrate superior efficacy if that study were to ever be done. Some of the limitations of Sprovado are obviously its, um, its um, overall less effectiveness compared to the IV ketamine, um, which is the racemic. It has a lower bioavailability. The package insert claimed that it has a 48% bioavailability, which is pretty lousy considering that um, uh, if you look at this chart here on the right, this is from the uh, Ketamine Academy course. It has um, pharmacokinetics of different routes of administration of ketamine. And so you can see IV has 100% bioavailability, intramuscular 90 to 93%, um, intranasal. We don't know what intranasal racemic is, but now we have data to show that the, um, that the S enantiomer is 48%. And then oral bioavailability of ketamine is 16 to 30%. And so to continue on the downsides of Sprovato, you've got inconsistent absorption because of the, the route of administration. If somebody's squeezing that, um, that device in their nose, some of it can be swallowed, some of it can be sneezed out, some of it can drip out. There's absorption issues with giving it intranasal because if somebody has um, allergies, uh, nasal congestion, inflammation, colds, then that can um, severely decrease the uh, absorption rate. And uh, so overall, it's half the ketamine molecule and um, is almost, uh, I don't have the data, but seems to be half as effective, essentially. So when it comes to the phase two study results, um, this is sort of the criteria that they were using. I'm sorry, that's just a phase three, actually. That's a typo there. Um, this is the criteria that they were using. They were using something called the MATTER score, which is the Montgomery Asperg Depression Rating Scale. This was a clinician-derived score versus the uh, other scoring, um, what do you call them, tools, I guess, the validated tools like BEX or the PHQ-9, where they're uh, patient-administered and patient-scored. But this kind of just sums up that. What they did here, too, was kind of interesting because they, they – they took the definition of uh, remission and sort of changed it a little bit. Um, typically, studies who use the MATTERS score use a score of less than or equal to 10 to define remission from depression symptoms. And they kind of adjusted that and said um, that they were going to use a score of less than or equal to 12. And they, they sort of... Uh, justified that by saying that, well, there's been a couple of other studies that have used a score of 12, and there may be a bias in that the clinicians tend to over um, score a little higher than a patient would self-score. So um, that's another interesting way that they were able to sort of, I wonder what the results would have been if they would have used a matter score of less than or equal to 12, which is what most studies use, versus having to alter the, essentially alter the the their definition of of remission depression remission so i thought that was pretty interesting and slightly shady um, way of calculating things so the response um as far as all these phase three studies a a good response was considered to be a 50 percent improvement from the baseline matters score so just to give you guys an idea of how they were scoring this stuff so again, only two of the studies reached statistical. Um, actually, it was three. Sorry, there's a typo there. I gotta correct some of these. You got uh, <clears throat> not a lot of sleep last night because the baby was crying. I don't know if you can hear her. She's crying right now again. But uh, so two of the studies, um, I'm sorry, three of the studies were able to achieve statistical significance. Two were not. 
Um, Spravato, how are you going to acquire it? So like we talked about in a, a few slides ago, Spravato has to be um, only acquired by a REM certified pharmacy or healthcare setting and it has to be only administered to a patient who's been in a, enrolled in the REM study. Cool, I see a comment here, uh, Noah Heller. And actually he's the developer of Mood Monitor. He's in here checking this out too, which is awesome. He said some of his customers are planning to use Mood Monitor to compare their results from S-ketamine and IV-ketamine. That will be interesting to see. Um, yeah, I would like to see that, that's pretty cool. Probably won't have a lot of um, strength when it comes to like backing that up because not a lot of um, scientific rigor behind that, but it would definitely be interesting to see and something that maybe, um, maybe we can get a doctoral student or a PhD or somebody, a DNP student to sort of compile that data. If anybody is interested in doing that, um, let me know and we will see if there's a way to sort of anonymously capture that data um, from Mood Monitor. I don't know if um, Noah would be able to do that to keep everything um, you know, HIPAA compliant, so no names, just data. And maybe we could, somebody can run the, the statistics on that. That would be kind of cool to see. So Spravata, uh, like I said, cannot be administered directly to the patients or delivered, or sorry, cannot be delivered directly to the patients. So um, we talked about the, the requirements for being certified here. When it comes to getting the Spravato, um, the Spravato website says that you have to have a full line wholesale distributor, uh, a wholesaler or a distributor and these are the ones they've listed on their site as already having enrolled to become distributors. So we have uh, Amerisaurus, Cardinal Health, McKesson. We have, uh, again, Cardinal Health as a distributor, McKesson, CureScript, haven't heard of them before, and then uh, Bessie Medical, haven't heard of them before either. Um, I'm sure there'll be more. Hopefully Henry Schein gets in on that because their prices are a lot better. McKesson is like, and Cardinal Health, their prices are insane. So when it comes to getting insurance coverage, Janssen offers this program called Janssen Care Path. And it, um, it will assist providers, which is pretty cool if you plan to administer this in your clinic. Um, it will take some of the load off of the providers because they will assist with finding out if the patient's insurance will cover this. And so I put the link here in the site. There's a lot more information on there. Um, yeah, just check out that link and it'll give you all the details. Uh, but they will they will literally call the insurance. They will notify the patient if their insurance covers it and then basically help expedite their treatment, which is pretty cool. Um, when it comes to insurance coverage, um, on their website here, I, I put a sample of a letterhead that they provided. Um, they've done a pretty good job of making it fairly easy for providers. They've created these different letterheads. So this is a letter of medical necessity and it basically outlines exactly what you need to type in there in order to get the Spravato covered. And if for some reason an insurance company doesn't cover it and you want to uh, request an exemption, then this is how you do that. This is a very similar letterhead. Uh, they put this on their website, it's downloadable. And essentially you just fill it in and submit it to the insurance company and ask for an exception. And hopefully they will cover it. When it comes to insurance coverage, uh, there is prior authorization uh, assistance right here at this number as well. So you can visit that link that I gave you or you can you can actually just call this number and they will help the patients find out if they can or the provider if they can get um, the prior authorization. So insurance coverage uh, continued. So this is a savings program that they have. It's, it's part of the Janssen's care path thing. Um, it is not part of Janssen is what they say. They say that this is not affiliated with Janssen in the small print. And so I'm not really sure what this program, how it's funded or where it comes from or whatever. But it, in the documents, it says that it's, um, it's, it covers the medication only. And um, here you can see the diagram on the, on the right hand side. It says it'll pay $10 per treatment of Spravato. Uh, up to a benefit of $7,150 per calendar year per patient. I have no idea where that money's coming from or how that works. I, I went and did a lot of digging. I actually filled out the forms as if I were a patient and they're supposed to be sending me a card 
and I'm assuming that card will hopefully have some instructions with it. Essentially, the like I said, this covers the drug itself, but it does not cover the actual administration. And it's not going to be valid for anybody, any patient that has government insurance or who is not insured. If you click through all the checkboxes on the site, you can see that it's not available for somebody unless they have private insurance. So I'm not, not really getting how that works. Somebody has information, feel free to share that. Maybe somebody who talked to a rep. So yes, Clint, that, that program there is not covered. No Medicaid, no Medicare patients can qualify for that program. It says right on that uh, patient enrollment area. If anybody's talked to a rep and knows a little bit more about that, feel free to put it in the chat. I know some people have already talked to some reps. I tried to get a hold of one and I wasn't able to yet. So this is all from their, their documents online. Uh, a little bit more about the savings program. So the patient has to be uh, able to pay the upfront payment at the time of treatment, the entire cost of the treatment upfront all at once. So this is a rebate program, essentially. It says that the patient needs to submit a rebate form, including proof of their payment. And so, again, I'm not entirely sure how that works. If they, they just get a rebate for the amount, for the cost of the drug. And if they have, if they have commercial insurance, uh, I would guess that that's going to cover most of the cost except for the copay. So maybe they're just, they're reimbursing for the copay. I'm not really sure. Happy to um, learn from somebody who might know a little bit more about that part. So the cost of the Spireba treatment, cash out of pocket, would be anywhere from, uh, it would be in the range of $590 per treatment up to $885 per treatment. So cash out of pocket, it's like a no-brainer. Why would you ever do this when you could get the IV racemic ketamine, which is much more effective? Um, so this really essentially only applies to patients with insurance so that the patients most likely wouldn't bear the brunt of this cost. It would be the insurance company. We have no idea how much the insurance is going to reimburse for this sort of, for the medication or for the treatment. And we have no idea uh, if insurances even are going to cover it. I would guess that they probably would now that it's FDA approved, but I haven't heard anything about insurance companies actually say stating that they're going to cover this yet. Pretty new, so. Does anybody have any questions? There's a, like a, like I said, a 30 second delay or so by the time I speak to the time it gets to Facebook and then I think there's a slight delay with the comments. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out. If there's anything that I missed, let me skim back through these. I feel like I forgot to say something. <clears throat> Talked about the certification. Well, feel free to type in the chat if you guys have any questions. If not, what I want to do, um, if you guys are interested in starting ketamine infusion therapy and want some help along the way, I'm happy to help anybody. I have uh, the online course, the Ketamine Academy. It is totally online. It literally covers step-by-step -step how to start a ketamine clinic. And I'm going to add all this uh, Spravato information, insurance information, as it becomes available into that course. And so I'm constantly updating it. We have a private Facebook group for students, uh, which I post some extra stuff in. And so Kathy's asking a question here. It says, so they're considered, they are considered experimental patients. Uh, Maybe, are you referring to the phase four part of the trial? They're not really experimental patients. The Janssen's still in phase four collecting additional data to uh, analyze, to make sure that it's safe. They're gonna check long -term side of, longer term side effects, things like that. So they're not necessarily experimental, but they're still collecting data. Um, we got another question that says, did you mention anything about the low dose not being effective? Uh, did you see that by chance? So the low dose, um, 
I think you're probably referring to the studies that did not show clinical significance. And in those studies, the low dose and the high dose did not show clinical significance. Um, I'm going to put that study document, the 263-page document from Janssen Pharmaceuticals, in the file section on this group. And so if you really want to dig into the details there, that'll be there for you guys to check out. Um, got another question. How much does it cost for the startup course for ketamine? So we do a discount for um, a pay up front sort of enrollment. It's a year of access. It's $24.99. Um, and you can, like I said, have a year of access to that. And we're constantly adding more information. It literally has all the forms you need. It has form templates. It has a whole business section, which makes up about 60% of the course. It has a pharmacology section. And we're actually about to roll out 2.0. And that's exciting. I've got a farm D who's rewritten and re uh, recorded the entire pharmacology section. So that's kind of exciting. Um, if you don't, um, or if you don't want to pay the $24.99 right now, you can um, subscribe to the three month um, payment plan, $99 a month. Um, someone said, I read it wasn't statistically significant compared to placebo. Yes. In two of those studies, it was not statistically significant. Two of the five. Um, somebody else is asking a question. So this one was sent from Janice. She sent this directly to me. It says, while looking through the info on the state board site for Arizona, it says RNs can give ketamine if they take a training course. Do, do you have one of those or know of one they could take? Um, so... If you have an RN who you might have working in your clinic, what I do for that is essentially anybody who works in the same clinic, if one person buys the course, I will provide additional accounts for $249 each, and that includes the, that you'll get your continuing education credits and your certificate of completion. So that's how I do that. If you just want an RN, um, PM me and maybe I can work something out. Uh, and just give you, you know, not the business section, just the ketamine part. Um, I got another question in here. Kathy says, why start at 54 milligrams and then 84 every other time? Why not start with 84? I think it's uh, due to safety. They're trying to be extra cautious. Uh, that's sort of actually how I didn't do my IV infusions. I always start the first dose a little lower because sometimes you get some sort of unexpected reactions to the IV. Some, pa some patients are very sensitive. Um, and they only require the low dose, but I always start at the lowest dose just to make sure that they're handling that okay, working through it okay, and then I move up. Um, it's probably the same sort of uh, rationale when it comes to the giving the lower dose of the nasal up front. If you have any more questions, feel free to, to put them in here. I'm happy to answer those for you if I know the answer. I don't know everything, but... Like I said, I had a, um, a ketamine clinic in Albuquerque that I ran for a little under a year. I, s I sold it to the nurse practitioner. Um, it did quite well. We were doing quite a few infusions. I did several hundred over um, the course of time that I owned it. And now I still work with that nurse practitioner. I actually do, um, if anybody's interested, I have an IV nutrition course. So a lot of ketamine clinics are adding IV therapy, IV nutritional therapy to their practice. Uh, just because you're already set up, it just makes sense. You've got IV stuff already there. And it's an extra, extra source of revenue. So I do have an IV therapy course. Um, I've partnered with another nurse practitioner who's really knowledgeable on that stuff. She had training from a uh, DO. And she, um, she essentially created the content for the course. And I essentially do the marketing in the back end for that course. Um, that course is $4.99 without the business content. If you want the business section, then it's $8.99. Um, so that's a pretty good addition for anybody who has a ketamine clinic. It literally teaches you how to calculate osmolarity. We've got 25 recipes. Um, some people don't like to call them recipes, but protocols for anything from uh, energy to, uh, I believe we've got a weight loss one in there. there. There's a bunch of different stuff in there. And then we talk about antioxidant infusions too, like glutathione. Um, somebody's asking, will this video be recorded? Yes, it will be recorded. I will make sure it's, it's in this group in the video section. Um, 
I'm saving the slides and any sort of downloadable for the, the Ketamine Academy students. That's going to go into the Ketamine Academy students Facebook group for the paid students. But uh, I want to help everybody out, so I'm going to give you this recording, just not the, the PowerPoint themselves or any, any of the downloadables. Um, those will just be for the actual students. Got to hold back a little bit for the for those that, that spent the, the money and invested into that course. So Somebody's asking... Do you know the price difference between the two doses? Uh, that is a good question. I do not. Uh, what was presented in everything I've seen is just that dose range. So I would guess that the low dose would be closer to the 590 versus the higher dose being close to the uh, whatever it was, 880 something. Um, somebody's asking how lucrative are the infusion clinics? It really depends on where you're located. So it's the profit margin per infusion is actually really high. The cost of providing an infusion, like the actual materials and supplies, is about $12 to $15. And typical price ranges around the country are $350 to $450 for a mental health infusion. And um, I've seen if you're going to do chronic pain infusions, those are longer. Those are like four hours in most cases, three to four hours. Um, you see different clinics doing different infusion times just because there's no set standard for that but uh, the cost for those you see clinics charge anywhere from 700 up to I've seen as much as 1500 in cities like uh, Manhattan so and how how lucrative the in clinics are it's they can be very lucrative if you're in a big clinic or I'm sorry in a big city with uh, not a lot of competition and good income demographics um, the what was it? The ketamine treatment centers had a partnership brochure that was floating around for a while where they were trying to get people to, into their partnership program. And in that brochure, they state that the average ketamine clinic should be able to earn a gross uh, over a million dollars established clinic. Um, so that's somebody they define that as a clinic that's been open a year to a year and a half at minimum. So grossing a million dollars for an IV infusion clinic. Then you have your expenses which materials are very low, and if you keep your overhead low, um, the expenses of running an infusion clinic are, are very small. Like, I had a 700-square-foot space with four infusion chairs, and I was paying $900 a month for um, the actual clinic space. And then you have things like um, furniture, cable, and any labor. Labor is the biggest expense if you have any additional help. I had nurse practitioners, I had a nurse, and I had a paramedic helping me out. So other questions... Um, somebody says, thank you for doing all this research. Yeah, absolutely. For some reason, I geek out on this stuff. I really enjoy learning about ketamine and helping everybody. Somebody is asking, what would be the advantage of offering both S-ketamine and IV? So I would say that the advantage, and I think a lot of clinics are on board with offering the, the S-ketamine because it opens up the market to patients and it opens up, um, you know, the opportunity for your clinic to get patients that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it. I think that patients that can afford the IV um, should be kind of steered in that direction. I mean, it's very clearly the, the most effective option for patients that just can't afford it, but they do have um, insurance, then, then they can get the, the nasal ketamine. And if that doesn't work, then maybe they can try the IV. But I think it opens up the doors to people who aren't willing or aren't able to pay the cash out of pocket price for the um, IV infusions, because they're, they're pretty expensive. I mean, at $400 a pop, um, a new patient for uh, IV ketamine will get six, for depression or mood disorder, will get six infusions typically in most clinics. And so you're talking $2,400 just for the initial treatment, and then they continue coming back for the boosters, um, which is similar to the nasal ketamine as far as continuing to return. Somebody said, yes, but overset, overhead and education for... Uh, MD referrals. Zohar. Yes, yeah, so exactly. Um, like I said, grossing, um, the ketamine treatment centers say a ketamine clinic should gross a million dollars, an average one that's established, and there's definitely overhead uh, involved. It's not typically a lot. Like, like you pointed out, there is marketing, there is labor, um, and then there's your lease. Those are, those are your three biggest expenses. The actual ketamine is incredibly cheap. You can get a box of ketamine that has 10 vials, 10 mLs each, 50 milligrams per mL, 
last I checked on Henry Schein, it was like $56 for a case. And as you're first starting up, a case will last you like a month or two um, until you get things going. And then you'll start to go through more. But it's incredibly inexpensive. It costs less than a dollar to give a dose of ketamine, of actual drug, to give a dose of ketamine to uh, a patient for a mood disorder. Um, any other questions? On your guys' end, like I said, I'll put this video in the video section. Downloadables are going to be reserved for the Ketamine Academy students. And same thing with the, the PowerPoints and stuff like that. Oh, and as far as uh, expenses, you also have to pay your malpractice, obviously. That's an expense, but if you're still working, most, most providers start up, um, when they start these clinics, they start them part-time. And... Because essentially you need to run run three infusions a week for a new patient for two weeks. So typically they're they're creating blocks of time on like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and then they're doing all their patients in those blocks of time as they're getting started and they're keeping their full-time jobs. And then kind of working into it and growing as they move, move along. Anybody here in the chat already have a ketamine clinic? Any comments on whether or not you're going to consider offering this. I know the the financial information is not quite out there yet as far as how much it's going to cost, or I'm sorry, how much the reimbursement is going to be. So, but if the reimbursement is reasonable, um, I, I would assume that most clinics, from what, from what I'm hearing from everybody, most clinics are on board to actually offer this service because it's going to be an additional source of revenue for the patients that otherwise wouldn't pay for the IV. Uh, Noah's asking if there's any idea of what the insurance companies will pay, the, the actual clinics for treating with S-ketamine. That's still yet to be determined. Um, as that data comes out, though, I'll put it uh, in this group, Ketamine Clinic Startup Group, and I'll, I'll also be putting it in the course. So as more information comes out, still so new, less than two weeks um, since its approval. But as financial information starts to get distributed in different groups because there's several different groups on Facebook. If you guys haven't checked out the Ketamine Providers group, that's a pretty good one as well. Um, this group has providers and people interested. The Ketamine Providers group has just, um, it's screened for just Ketamine Clinic owners and Ketamine Clinic providers. And so over there you see more case study type of questions and posts, um, which is very interesting. It's a great learning tool. Here you get some of that in this group, you get some of that as well, um, but you also get a lot of like generalized business questions and more uh, more generalized types of questions, not necessarily a whole lot of uh, patient case studies. And that other group is called the Ketamine. I can tell you what it's called here. Um, and they will verify that you, um, it's run by another CRNA, uh, Kimberly. Um, it's called Ketamine Infusions Group for Physicians and Providers Only. Very valuable uh, resource to ask any sort of case study or present case study types of questions. Only open to providers. It's run by a CRNA, and they will uh, verify your credentials before letting you in that group. Anybody have any questions, last-minute questions, before I sign off? Um, if it's okay with you, I want to share a quick video. I'm going to start a new podcast, and it is called, um, if it's okay with you, if I can share this information, type it, type yes in the comments section. Just type yes if I can share this information with you real quick. It's completely free. It's going to be a podcast and a YouTube channel. And I'm waiting for my first yes before I actually share the information. I think you guys are going to love it. It is, if you have any in interest at all in business and creating additional streams of income or healthcare business related type of stuff, then you are definitely going to want to check this out and I'll give some more information. Um, Kathy says, uh, Kim is a nurse practitioner retired due to disability. Yes, she is. She's retired. She's actually a ketamine patient as well. Um, she openly talks about that. Uh, she's the owner of the other group. Her name is Kim. Okay, cool. We got a couple of yeses. Looks like there's about a minute delay. So this is a new YouTube um, channel. This is going to be also, if you're more of a podcast type of person, if you want to listen to it on the drive into work, because YouTube is kind of hard to do that. Um, I'm going to take the audio out of these interviews, this is what they're going to be, and I will put that into a podcast format as well. And essentially what I'm going to be doing is interviewing some top-notch 
healthcare entrepreneurs. And this is like super exciting. Um, I do my first interview next week, but I'm going to be interviewing people who have figured out how to leverage their healthcare experience, healthcare knowledge to create additional streams of income and or completely get out of like bedside care um, and, and just running their healthcare related business. And so we've got people um, like Noah, maybe I can get, get you on Noah. He's created the Moon Monitor app. Um, I've got interviews lined up with some with uh, some inventors, two different inventors so far. I've got interviews lined up with somebody who owns a, gosh, he's um, a seven figure practice. I can't really say too much yet. He wants me to not uh, disclose it at this moment, but uh, a CRNA who has created a seven figure business outside of anesthesia. Um, we have some anesthesia group owners. We have, uh, we have podcasters, we have digital course creators, we have CE creators, we have uh, travel education companies. You're going to see all sorts of really cool people that I'll be interviewing live on Facebook in my other group, which is called the Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy group. So that is the, the, um, the bonus. And I'm going to show you real quick here a video um, of the introduction. We just got our podcast intro recorded, and I'm going to play that for you. Right now. Well to Healthcare Entrepreneur Academy, where we seek to educate, motivate, and inspire professionals into starting their own healthcare businesses. Learn from leading healthcare entrepreneurs and other business experts as they share their journey and provide a glimpse into their playbooks for success. Loaded with valuable insights and actionable strategies, this show will guide you on your path to freedom. Now, please welcome your host, entrepreneur and healthcare practitioner, Jason DePratt. Cool. So that was just a little teaser of the intro to the podcast slash um, YouTube channel. And again, those interviews are going to be live in the other Facebook group. Um, that's one of the reasons why I want to put this together for you and to practice this whole live situation. I literally have uh, two laptops, uh, my phone and a third monitor uh, with multiple cameras and microphones to make sure that everything goes off without a hitch. So anyways, thanks you guys very much. Um, we are just about done here. If you have any last second questions, I'll take those real quick. Otherwise, I'm going to sign off. Thank you for um, checking out this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got some valuable information out of it. Again, if you're interested in the Ketamine Academy course or IV Therapy Academy course, uh, reach out. The Ketamine Academy website is ketamineacademy.com. The other website is, um, what is it? ivtherapyacademy.com. So I don't see any more questions coming in. I will sign off again. Thank you guys. It was a pleasure and be on the lookout for more videos like this because I'm probably going to be doing more in this group um, specific to marketing. I know a lot of clinics are um, struggling with the digital marketing aspect of things. So I like to help out in that area. It's really one of my fortes. All right, guys, but we'll check you later. Thanks again. Bye-bye.